P-O-G, once again, Pastor Michael Hayes back with you on this incredible Monday morning. It is a beautiful Monday morning. It really is a sunny and bright Monday morning here in beautiful uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's an interesting morning for me because I don't know what it is, but for some reason, everybody on our street has decided to do yard work all at the same time of the morning. So, uh, there's a lot of noise outside. I don't know whether you can hear it or not, but uh, there's a lot going on. There's actually construction going on outside. People are cutting their lawns. People are trimming their tr bushes and tr trims and all at the same time. I don't know why. Everybody just decided to get up at 8 o'clock, I guess, and, uh, you know, just start cutting and chopping and building and cutting in wood and putting brick up and I don't know. It's interesting to say the least. Nonetheless, I digress. Glad to be back with you on this incredible Monday morning. It is June the 29th. If you can believe it, we are at the end of June <clears throat> and uh, we're about to move right into July on Wednesday morning. So, uh, you know, say goodbye to June, everybody. <laughs> it won't be long now. And ju hasn't June flown by? Can you? I can't even believe it's June is gone. I mean, I don't know. These days are just running into each other. I don't know if it's 2020 that's, you know, the, the, the issue or if it's just, that's just the way it is. I don't know. It's just weird. These days are just running into each other. And uh, oftentimes it's difficult for us to tell one day from the next. Nonetheless, it's still good that we serve the Lord and that the Lord is still on our side. Amen. Amen. I pray and trust that you had a good weekend uh, and a good Sunday uh, and that things went well for you. Uh, we're going to go right into our text this morning, which is found in the book of Proverbs chapter 16, reading verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16, and we're looking at verse number 18. Let's see what the word of God has for us this morning. Proverbs 18 and, uh, 16, excuse me, and verse number 18, the Bible declares, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Again, for emphasis, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before before a fall. Today, we're talking and uh, discussing the theme of rising and falling, rising and falling. Let's bow our heads briefly for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy in our lives. Lord, be with us now as we enter into your word. Let your spirit breathe into us, Lord, a new revelation of understanding. Uh, that, Father, we might, in fact, be changed and transformed by your word today. We desire it. We need it. We need transformation. We need your love today. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And then, Lord, we ask, give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> so pride, the Bible says, goes before a fall. It would appear from this text, and I believe that it is true, that every time you and I fall to temptation, uh, every time you and I commit the act of sin, as opposed to the condition of sin, which we're going to talk about a little bit, but every time that you and I would uh, perform an act of sin, there is a prerequisite 
to that eventual result. And that prerequisite is pride. I don't think you can sin the act without some form of pride. Pride is haughtiness, high-mindedness, thinking of one higher, better, and greater than one's self truly is. Good morning. Good morning, Elder Palmer. Proverbs is telling us that the reason just for every sin that we commit in our lives and the reason for us having a sinful condition in our lives comes from pride from us thinking or believing that we're better than what we truly are. Now, this is very significant, very significant. All sin, all sin has the prerequisite of pride before it. That's what this text is telling us. And the text is telling us also that if and when you do have pride in your life, there is an inevitable precipitous fall on the way. There is an inevitable precipitous fall on the way. It might be tomorrow. It might be in the next hour. It might be in the next 10 seconds. It might be in the next two years. But inevitably, where pride takes residence in your life, there is going to be an equal, an equal and uh, a resident fall in your life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, keep us from pride. Pride is a poison to the heart. It's a poison to the heart and to the soul and to the mind of humanity. It hardens our hearts and it keeps us from loving and forgiving others. It corrodes all our relationships. Pride does. Pride corrodes and erodes and destroys from the inside out all our relationships. It cauterizes the soul against correction and warnings. In other words, I don't want to hear that. I don't want you to tell me what's wrong with me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. Pride does that to us. It keeps us from receiving good counsel. In fact, pride keeps us from knowing that there is good counsel to be heard or listened to or received. It cauterizes our heart against the things of goodness, grace, mercy, love, kindness. It leads to terrible backslidings and constant cons and consistent spiritual failures. Pride, pride, pride is the issue. Pride is the issue. This is a huge, huge subject. And I don't have all day, obviously, to talk about it, but nonetheless, it is imperative that you and I understand that pride is something that we don't need to have. Now, there's a lot of pride things going on right now. I know there's, there's pride parades and pride celebrations right now and pride this and pride that. We don't need to be involved in pride, any form of pride, any form. It doesn't matter what it is. Pride goes before a fall. That is a rule of the universe. This is what the text is telling us. Any form of pride, any iteration of pride is going to precede a fall. And if we don't get this straight, here's, here, 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 here listen to me, listen to me. Any sin that you see out here, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's racism, sexism, whatever kind of other ism it is. Whatever, it's all preceded by pride. The reason why it's out here is because somebody is living in pride. 
somebody's living in pride or some people are living in pride or some city is li or some county or some state or some nation is living in pride. And when you have this idea of pride presiding over your life, you are inevitably going to hit a huge, huge precipitous fall. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's not a question of whether it will. It's only a question of whether when it will happen. Pride blinds the mind to the dangers and the risks. And so a man or a woman rushes into foolishness and choices and destruction without the ordinary caution that most people would take. So the first point I want to make in, this, in terms of this idea of rising and falling, this idea, the concept of pride before a fall, pride lifting up before I get let down, raising myself up before I get let down. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of balances. Raise, pride is raising myself up artificially before I get let down very, very quickly. That's what pride is. That's what pride is. It's building myself up only to let myself get back there, uh, get back beat down or torn down or pulled down or shoved down, however you want to look at it. Watch this. The first point I want to make is this. Pride brings with it a false sense of security. Pride brings with it a false sense of security. When you and I are living in pride, we have this tendency to believe or understand or think, I'm not going to get caught. Uh, nobody can touch me. Uh, I'm at a level right now. I'm, I'm, living at, I'm living my best life. I'm fine. I don't need any help. I don't need anybody to tell me anything. I, I, you have this false sense of security. Can't nobody touch me. Nobody can come near me. I'm above and beyond everybody else. I'm the best this. I'm the best that. I'm above. I'm beyond. I don't need. All of these things are exhibitions of pride residing and living, growing in one's life. And pride brings with it this false sense of security. You have this concept in your mind and heart that says, well, it's not really that big. Uh, you know, it's not going to bother me. What's bothering others is not going to bother me. Pride. And we see that transpiring right now in terms of this COVID-19 situation. I don't need to wear a mask. Why do I have to wear a mask? I'm fine. I'm different. I'm special. Let me call my doctor and get my doctor to, to write a letter to tell everybody else that I'm not like you. Pride. Pride. Watch this. Obadiah. Chapter one and verse number three, Obadiah, a book that most of us <laughs> rarely read. It's only one chapter in the Old Testament. Obadiah chapter one and verse number three. Notice what the word of God says. This is God talking to these people who live in high places. This is from the English Standard Version. Here's what the Bible says. Obadiah one and verse three, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock. In your lofty dwellings, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? He says, pride has deceived you and has got you saying out of your own mouth, from your own lips, who can bring me down? I'm living up here on the high places of life. I'm hidden here in the cleft of the rock. Nobody can penetrate this rock where I'm living. Nobody can reach up to the height of where I am. This is what pride does. It deceives you. It makes you think that you're greater and better than what you really are. It makes you believe that you're safer and more secure than you really are. Notice Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse number 16. The Bible says this. Jeremiah 49, 16. The honor, I'm sorry, the horror you inspire has deceived you and the pride of your heart, you who live in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, you 
Though you make your nest as high as the eagles, I, this is God speaking, I will bring you down from there. From the highest of heights, declares the Lord God. God says, I, there's no way, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you live up on the high. I'm not going to let you live up there like that. And the reason why God does that is because God knows that that's a place where salvation cannot reach. Pride is the antithesis of salvation. I'm going to say that again. Pride is the antithesis of of salvation. You cannot be saved and have pride. It's not possible. It is not possible. I don't care what kind of pride it is. Pride, parade, pride, all, all everybody with pride. I'm uh, taking pride. No, honey, you don't you, because what's what's happening is you are being deceived. You think you're actually standing on solid ground when you're not. You're actually standing on sand. You think you live up here in the high places, you're really down in the gutter. And it's about to be revealed to you. Are you all with me today? Pride has a way of deceiving us into believing that we are higher, better, more secure, more safe than we really are. And as a, as, and as a result of that, as a result of that, pride often, more often than not, causes us to misjudge and to poorly assess others in relationship to ourselves. Now I'm going to show you this in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number four. Pride has this tendency to build us up, to lift us up and make us think that we're better than what we really are. And by virtue of doing that, pride has a tendency to color our eyes, to put a shadow over our eyeglasses that when we look and see other people, we think differently of them than ourselves. Watch this, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 42. Here's a prime example of a story that you and I know very well. It's the story of David and Goliath. David, the little small ruddy boy, red, uh, uh, <laughs> if you will, red and ruddy, full of, fl uh, of blood, flesh boy, who had a beautiful visage about himself, visage about himself, but he was a boy. He was a young man who went out there to fight the king of the, you know, of Thunderdome, right? The king of the Battle Dome, Goliath, who had many, many wins under his belt, if you will. And here he is. He comes out there into the valley to meet the uh, the champion, if you will, of Israel. He's been calling them out for week after week after week. Come on, send somebody down here. Come on, come on, let me wipe the floor with him and then you guys will be our servants. And if he beats me, uh, we'll be your servants. Whatever happens, you, you just let us know. But send somebody down, send the champion down. And everybody was scared. Finally, David came on the scene and David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? This, this, this. <laughs> person who doesn't even know God, got the nerve to put God in his mouth. He said, I'm going to show him who God is. Send me out there. And they were scared. They didn't want to send him out there, little skinny boy. But God pressed it on. And finally, he went out there with some stones in his bag and a little staff uh, on his right hand or left hand. And he went down there in the valley of Edom to see and meet this giant, probably 20 something feet tall. Who knows? Are y'all with me today? And this is what happened when the giant saw this young man. First Samuel 17, verse 42, he said this, when the Philistine looked and saw David, watch this, when he looked and when he saw David, he disdained him. He despised him. It, that means he put him down in his estimation. For he was but a youth, a ruddy and handsome in appearance man. In other words, here's what I'm saying. Pride in Goliath caused him to look at the youth of this man. The youth of this man. He was not a boy, he was a man. But he looked at the youngness of this man, the inexperience of this young man. 
And that even pushed his pride even higher and caused him to look at David as somebody who was nowhere near his equal. Oh, how many times do we do this? How many times do we look at somebody? We don't even know their character. We don't know anything about them, but we just look at them. We look at them externally and we say, I'm better than them. We despise them for the color of their skin. We despise them for the size of their stomach. We despise them for the height of their stature or the shortness of their stature. We despise them. We, we declare that they're nowhere near us. And we basically look at ourselves and look at them and we say, we compare ourselves with ourselves. And the Bible says, when you do that, you judge wrongly. You're not to compare yourself with other people. You're to compare yourself with Christ. And every time you're going to lose that comparison. Come on, say amen. And so here the giant is. He's out here. He's telling them, listen, I can't believe. What? Who, are, you, are you all serious? <laughs> you're sending this idiot out here? This joker who hadn't fought one fight, one battle? What he didn't know was that David had killed a bear and a lion. Oh, I wish I had help in here today. And it wasn't because of his incredible strength or his uh, uniqueness in uh, the logistics of his fighting skills. No, no, no. It was because the spirit of the Lord had come upon him when the bear and the lion would dare snatch one of God's sheep. And ladies and gentlemen, he went out there and he killed the lion and the bear with his bare hands. Not because of David's power or prowess, or ingenuity in fighting. No, it was because the spirit of the Lord was with him. Somebody say hallelujah. And ladies and gentlemen, the spirit of the Lord was with him down there in the valley with that eight, with that giant Goliath. And ladies and gentlemen, because of the giant Goliath's pride, he took a precipitous fall. It didn't take but one stone. That's all it took. One stone one stone. He got all this armor on. David doesn't even come out there with armor on. He doesn't have any shekel armor. He doesn't have any plating. He doesn't have any bulletproof vests. He doesn't even have a gun. He ain't got nothing out there but a few rocks in his back. Are y'all listening to me today? I'm talking about pride. Rising and falling. David lowered himself before the Lord. He submitted himself before the Lord. And he took out a giant who was high and lofty in his own estimation. Lord have mercy. Pride brings with it a false sense of security. Secondly, number two, pride, pride has a way of causing us to refuse to forgive others. Pride has a way of causing us to refuse to forgive others. As a matter of fact, a refusal to forgive is based in pride. I'm going to say it again. A refusal to forgive others is based in our pride, our own pride. What are you talking about, preacher? Pride as in you think you're better than them. That's what I'm talking about. Let me just make it plain. When you refuse to forgive other people, it's because you're saying, I'm better than you, and I, you don't, you're not worth me forgiving you because I'm better than you. That's what pride is. I said it. Yes, I said it. I don't care. I don't care that you don't like it. Not concerned about that. The truth of the matter is pride causes us to refuse to forgive people. Notice with me, Mark. Chapter 11, verse 25, English Standard Version of the Bible says this. Mark 11 and verse 25 says this. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father who also is in heaven, watch this, watch this, may forgive you your trespasses. You see that? Here, here watch this, watch this. This is, what, this is what the text is saying. The text is saying, when you are estimating and judging whether or not you should forgive somebody, 
Here's what the text is saying. When you're, when you're trying to figure out, should I or should I not forgive this person? The text is saying this. Remember, you need to be forgiven. <laughs> Woo! I wish I had help in here today. I wish I had help in here today. The text is telling you whenever you're in the middle of assessing whether or not you should forgive somebody else, the first thing you need to do is remember. Somebody say remember. Remember! You, you stand to be forgiven or not forgiven. Somebody is judging you. I wish I had help in here today. And the same judgment, the Bible says, that you use to judge somebody else, whether or not you ought to forgive them. God says, I'm going to use that same judgment on you. I'm going to use the same assessment on you. I'm going to use the same standard on you. I'm going to, say, I'm going to use the same logistical plan that you use to forgive or not to forgive somebody else. I'm going to use that on you. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy on our souls. How many times have we refused to forgive somebody else? It's Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Tony. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Notice with me. This is from the Good News Bible version, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 17. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 17. Now I've heard people, people come to me, pastor, why do you use so many versions? Why don't you just use one version? Isn't one version better than the other? No, no, it's not. No, it's not. Well, uh, aren't some versions, don't they, you know, uh, uh, some versions are evil. Some versions are wicked. No, 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 no. What you need to do is read your Bible. See people, well, what, what Bible should I read? And when, if you read the Bible, the Bible will interpret itself so that you can read any version of the Bible and you will gain the true understanding of the spirit in the Bible that's trying to reveal and be revelatory towards you. When you're looking at one version, most people that have a problem with different versions of the Bible are people who don't read the Bible. Let me move on. That's a whole nother animal. Let me move on. So Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 17 says this. Leviticus 19 and verse 17 says this, do not bear a grudge against others, but settle your differences with them so that you will not commit a sin because of them. Do not take revenge on others or continue to hate on them, but love your neighbors as you love yourself. I am the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's in the Old Testament. That's not New Testament. That's not, people say, well, there's no, there's no grace in the Old Testament. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's right here in the Bible. Right here in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. Are you all with me today? Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. He says, do not bear a grudge against a neighbor or others, but instead settle your differences with them with logic and reasoning so that you will not Commit a sin against them. What sin? What sin are you talking about, pastor? What sin are you talking about, preacher? What sin are you talking about, God? The sin of pride. The sin of thinking you're better than them because you got something over on them because they've done something wrong to you. And they're indebted to me now. And now I'm just going to ride the wave of their indebtedness to me. And I'm going to tell everybody all the wrong they did to me. And oh, woe is me. And I'm so so sorrowful. And hey, oh, it's just terrible what they did to me. That's a sin. That's a sin, God says. Forgive your brother. Make it right with each other. Come on, say amen out here. Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge. Revenge is mine, says the Lord. Don't take revenge. Here again, when you take revenge, you're saying, I'm better than you. That's what you're saying. You're using pride. You're sinning. Notice with me, Galatians chapter six and verse one. Powerful text. Powerful text right here. We're talking about 
This idea of not learning and understanding that we need to forgive each other, that we need to understand that pride goes before a fall. We need to recognize that we don't need to lift ourselves up above our brothers and our sisters, comparing ourselves with ourselves. You need to compare yourself with God. And when you feel and realize that you and God are not the same, then recognize. Somebody say recognize. <laughs> recognize. Galatians chapter six and verse number one. Now this, listen, this is for every pastor right now. If you're not, if you're a pastor, you really need to listen to this, especially, or any type of minister, you need to listen to this. Galatians chapter six and verse number one says this. I use this all the time in my ministry. Galatians six and verse one, brethren, if a man or a woman be overtaken in any fault, you that are spiritual restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou be also tempted. Now, this is a powerful text right here. Powerful text. He says, brethren, if you are going to minister to somebody who's been taken in a fall, what does that tell you? If somebody has fallen, what does that tell you? According to the text of Proverbs 16 and verse number 18, if somebody has fallen in sin, what does that tell you? According to the text, Proverbs 16, verse 18, what does that tell you? It tells you that that person at some point was walking in pride. Are, are you all with me today? At some point, that person took on the mantle of pride and now they are in a fallen state. Are y'all with me today? And so here's what the text is saying. Galatians chapter six and verse one. The text is declaring to us, you who are spiritual. That means those who are wise with the wisdom of God. You who are spiritual. Watch this. He said, restore that person or bring that person back into the fold, back into right relationship with you, with God and with humanity, with the church. Make sure that you restore them to the place where they fell from. Watch this, but be careful. This is what he says. Be careful while you're doing that. Be careful while you're helping somebody else who's fallen. Be careful because pride can overtake you. You can get the concept or idea that because you're helping somebody else who has fallen, that you're better than them because you haven't fallen yet. And the text is saying, be careful because a fall is right there in front of you too. And ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. When you're ministering to people, and this is for every pastor, I say this all the time for every pastor, because pastors have a tendency to preach about righteousness, to preach about justice, to preach about loyalty, to preach about compassion, to preach about holiness, to preach about purity, to preach about obedience. Are y'all with me today? And so there's a tendency for us to get up on a high horse and you have this idea when you're talking and preaching to your parishioners or to people who haven't learned what you've learned yet, you have a tendency to think that you're better than them. I'm just telling you, pride just has this way of inching its way into your heart and into your mind. And sometimes you can come home and you've preached the word of God and you've delivered the word of God and people weren't particularly listening the way you thought that they should have or people didn't receive the word the way you thought. And pride will get up in your mind and you'll get upset that folk didn't listen to you the way you wanted them to listen to you. And you will say, I can't believe these people. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm so sick of these people. They won't listen. They're hard headed. They're stick neck and this, that and the other. And the next thing you know, you think you're better than them. And the next thing you know, when you think you're better than them, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Pride goes before fall. And the next thing you know, the preacher has fallen. Are you all listening to me? Every preacher that's fallen is a preacher who is living in pride. Lord have mercy. I know nobody wants to hear it. I know nobody wants to hear it, but it's the truth anyhow. They were living in pride. They thought themselves higher than they really were. 
they thought themselves more secure than they actually were. And there's a tendency as a minister of the gospel, as a preacher of righteousness, as you read the word of God every day, there's a tendency for you to say, well, I read the word every day. Everybody else doesn't read the word every day. Obviously, I'm better than everybody else. As soon as you think that, God will pull back the covers of your life and will reveal the real you on the inside. And the next thing you'll know, Lord have mercy, you're trying to pull yourself out of a ditch that you didn't even see coming. I wish I had help in here. I'm talking about what I've personally experienced. I'm not talking about what I've seen. I've seen and heard a bunch of stuff, but I'm talking about what I have personally experienced in my own life. I know about what I'm talking about. I know exactly about what I'm talking about. I know what it's like to feel like I'm better than other people simply because I'm preaching the word of God. And God has a way of showing me, you, and everybody else, honey, <laughs> you need me more than you think you do. In fact, you need me more than they do. Lord have mercy. Don't get me started on this. I'll stay here all day. <laughs> number three, point number three is this. The wise forgive and live in peace with one another in humility. Point number three. The wise person, knowing that pride goes before a fall, what will they do in response? They will, watch this, they will live their lives in humility and in peace with each other. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15 says this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15 says this. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Here's what Paul says in Hebrews. He says, listen, make sure that you find peace with all men. And he said, watch this, make sure that everybody Everybody receives and obtains the grace of God. Make sure that everybody knows it's by God's grace that you're saved. Hallelujah. Through faith, and that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Somebody say amen. Make sure that everybody is a receiver of God's grace, not your own grace. Of God's grace peace, not your own peace, of God's favor, not your own favor. Make sure, in other words, that you're humbled before the grace of God, humbled by the grace and the gifting of God into your life. And then he says, when you do that, make sure that bitterness doesn't root itself in your life. Don't hold grudges against people, bitter and upset and all, oh, I wanted, I expected this, but I didn't get it. Now you upset and mad and peeled at other people. Oh, the pride. It takes root in your life. It springs up and it causes trouble, the Bible says. Trouble that causes you to become defiled. Whew. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. We're talking about wise people learn to live in peace with one another and have humility as an earmark of their life. Notice Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27 says this, be angry, be ye angry, but don't you sin. What do you mean, pastor? Read the text. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Go down on your anger. Go down on your frustration. Neither do you, neither, watch this, give place to the devil. Here's what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying when you hold grudges against your brothers and sisters, when you have hatred in your heart against evil in your heart, what happens is you're building up the resources and the foundation of pride. And ladies and gentlemen, wherever the devil sees pride, he comes close to you. Oh, he comes close to you. Oh, and he strokes that pride. He just rubs your back at night. Oh, and he's, 
Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. That's what they did it to you. I know. And you're all you're so much better than they are. I mean, it's horrible. It's terrible how they treat you. Isn't it just horrible? And you're so much of a better person. You took the high road and they took the low road. You're just a great person. And see, the, the devil just rubs it in. You know, you deserve better than that. You deserve better than them. You should, you should be pissed off at them. You should be mad at them because they deserve your anger. They deserve, and he just rubs your back. He's rubbing your back, but what you don't realize is he's rubbing your back with nails in his hands. I wish I had help in here. And he's just ripping apart your back and it's wide open. You don't even realize it. And he's tearing you down from the inside out. The devil just comes and he, yeah, I know. And they're just, these people are just wicked. They're just horrible. And you're just so much better than them. Look at you. You go to church every week. You read the Bible. You get on PTPOG every day. You're so much better than them. You make better choices than they do. You're so much smarter than them. They're just dumb and evil and wicked and they just hate you. They're jealous of you. Oh, yeah, you need to get rid of them. We need to, yeah, let's just get, be mad at them. They're just, see, that's what the devil does. He take, listen, he glatches onto your anger because anger, when it's allowed to fester and grow, turns into pride. And pride, we all know, goes before, before what everybody before a fall. Lord have mercy. That's why the Bible says when you are looking for elders in first Timothy chapter three and verse six, he told Timothy, look, when you're trying to find bishops and elders, people to oversee the church, he said, you make sure of this one thing. First Timothy chapter three and verse six as one of the qualifications for such men to be over the church. This is what he said. If you're looking for people to be over the church, first Timothy chapter three, verse six, he says this, don't get a novice. Don't get somebody who has no experience, who don't know nothing about the things of God. He said, because what will happen is, lest they be lifted up in pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Whew. It's Listen, you got to be careful about lifting people up too fast that don't have any real experience with the Lord. You got to be careful because you'll put them in a high position of authority in the church and the next thing you know, they start thinking that they're better than everybody else because they don't understand the true nature of God's grace. And God has to allow them to fall in order to save them. Mm, mm, mm. See, this is the blessing of falling. But you know the reason why you're falling? Because God allows it because God wants to save you. I'm going to say that again. Whenever you are overtaken by a fall, it is a part of your salvation process. God is allowing you to fall and fail so that you can recognize that you can't make it without him. It's a blessing to fail because it's proof positive that you are not relying on the Lord, but you're living in pride and God is trying to save you amen so in some sense you ought to be happy that God is allowing you to fail because it's causing you to be drawn closer to him that's why first Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 and 7 says this first Peter chapter 5 verses 6 and 7 say this and this is, I'm closing on this. First Peter chapter five, verses six and seven say this. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. When you fall, when you fail, when you mess up, when you screw up, when you jack it all up. Are y'all listening to me today? I'm talking about when you really mess it up. And even when you mess up just a little bit and people don't see it. When you mess up when the whole world sees it and when you mess up in a little bit and nobody sees it. In both cases, humble yourself 
In other words, take it down, take it down a peg or two. Lower yourself before the mighty hand of God. Submit yourself before the power of the mighty right hand of God, the hand of God that took Israel out of Egypt with one foul swoop. The mighty hand of God that has one finger that he took and he swept it through the Red Sea and the people walked on dry land. Let the mighty hand of God, hallelujah, be your savior. Submit yourself to the power of God, he says. Lower yourself, bend down, kneel before the power of God. And this is what God is going to do. God said, instead of letting you fall, I'm going to keep you. <laughs> instead of letting you fail, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you successful. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to, watch this, I'm going, I, not you, I, God, the Lord God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider, God himself, I'm going to lift you up in my time. And I'm going to teach you how to cast all your cares on me because you're going to learn how much I really love you. It's a relationship. See, instead of lifting yourself up, lower yourself and watch God work. That's the point. That's point number four. Instead of lifting yourself up, lower yourself and watch God work. Watch God work. Hallelujah. Watch God work. I don't need to work. I want to watch God work. Huh? Huh? I want to watch God at work. I'm tired of watching myself work. My works don't work. They ain't worth a dime. I'm looking for God's work to work in my life. Can you say amen today? Pride goes before a fall. Oh, but when you lower yourself and submit yourself to the mighty hand of God, mm, God will raise you up. And when God, which, watch this, when God lifts you up, when God prompts you up, when God lifts you and elevates you, no man and no demon or devil in hell can pull you down because you're not, watch this, you're not standing on human ground. You're standing on holy ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're standing on holy foundation. Can't nobody grab you. Can't nobody pull you down. Are you all with me today? Mm, mm, mm. It's amazing. God has a way of lifting his people up. God has a way of blessing his people. Oh, they were so mad at Daniel. Daniel was the one who would pray all the time. Daniel was, they were so sick of him. You remember in the book of Daniel? Oh, they were so tired of him. They were so mad at him. Oh, he was just, oh, just ad nauseum. He was always talking about God, always praying three times a day. So you know what they did? They whispered in the, in the, uh, they whispered in the, uh, 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 the king's ear and they said, King, Listen, you know, you really are all that in a bag of chips. You know that? Here's what you need to do, King. You need to let people know that they don't need to pray to anybody else but you for 30 days. That's what you need to do because you are God. And the king listened with his dumb self and said, yeah, you know what? You're right. And the king put forth a law that said nobody who prayed to anybody but him, hmm, the people who prayed to anybody but him, they're going to be thrown to the lion's den. Are you all listening to me? These guys, they were jealous of Daniel. Jealous of Daniel. They were trying to pull him down a peg or two. We're going to let him know, uh-uh, you don't do that up in here. This is uh, this, this is Babylon. We, we run it our way. You don't be bringing other gods up in here. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you know what happened? They called, they caught Daniel, of course, because they knew he prayed with an open window three times a day to his God. And of course, they caught him and trapped him. And, you know, Daniel didn't know anything about what was going on. And so they trapped him. They locked him up, brought him before the king and said, King, 
Well, he broke your law. He broke your law. And the king was so upset because he knew that Daniel was just a great and marvelous man, a man who understood the dreams of the, uh, the dreams of kings, a man who could interpret the dreams of those who couldn't even remember what they dreamed. And he was so upset with himself and so upset with his, you know, uh, uh, his counselors who had him, who gassed him up, who gaslighted him into putting this stupid law out that you can't pray and all this old foolishness. But lo and behold, the king had already said the law. So what happened? The king put him in a pit with the lions. Oh, but what the king didn't know. Oh, but what the enemies of Daniel didn't know is that, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel was living on the pedestal of God. <laughs> you can put him down in whatever you, wherever you want to put him. He's going to raise up. He's going to lift up. He's going to rise up. And they put him down there with the lions. And ladies and gentlemen, you know what happened? The lions shut them out. The lions looked like a bunch of cats down there. Whining and moaning and uh, purring. And they're just loving on Daniel, just licking his face, you know. Lord have mercy. They left him down there all night long. Covered it up. The pit came back the next day. The king was just, he was just flabbergasted. He was just, you know, beside himself. Oh, I pray, Lord, Daniel, Daniel, did God, did your God keep you? Did your God keep you? Ladies and gentlemen, the call came out from that darkened spot in the earth. Daniel cried out and said, O king, live forever. <laughs> Woo! I love it. O king, live forever. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, they lifted that young man out of that pit. And ladies and gentlemen, the king said, get those soothsayers, get those counselors that had me gaslighting me and had me all lifted up in my pride in myself and caused me to kill my friend. I want them right here, right now. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says he told his soldiers Throw those jokers in the same pit. Throw them in the pit. So for, so therefore, the very trap that they set for Daniel, they were actually setting for themselves. Whew. I don't even have time. I don't even have time. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that before their bodies hit the floor, there used to be a song out called Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. Y'all know that's old crazy song. <laughs> Before the bodies hit the floor, ladies and gentlemen, the lions were tearing them limb from limb. <laughs> you know why? Because they didn't have the protection of God. They were lifted up on their own pedestals. Pride goes before a fall. Hallelujah. Pride goes before a fall. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you. I don't want to get ripped apart by lions. I don't want to get entrapped in my own devisings. Huh? The things that I'm setting up for traps for other people. I don't want to get lit and ripped up in that type of trap for myself. Hello, Naaman. I want God to lift me up in his due time. And if he doesn't want me to be lifted up, I won't lift myself up. I'll let it happen God's way. Come on, say amen. We're going to bathe it in God's way. So ladies and gentlemen, always remember, lower yourself that God will elevate you and lift you to his height of righteousness. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness towards us. And Lord, we've learned today that pride definitely goes before every single fall in our lives. And Lord, how many falls we have had, we have had and we have experienced. It just reflects and reveals that we are full of ourselves. We are so full of ourselves, Lord. We love looking at ourselves in the mirror and imagining that we are better than what we are. Oh God, please pull back the covers and reveal our true selves to us. 
and help us to notice and recognize that without you, we can do absolutely nothing. This is what your son said. Your son said, without my father, I can do nothing. Lord, help us to be like Jesus. To recognize that all things are possible through him who loved us. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, cover our lives with your life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, listen, God be with you. God bless you. I pray this has been a blessing to you. If it has, please like it and share it and subscribe to PTPOG Ministries if you haven't already. If you haven't, just go and click inside of your search engine, inside of your Facebook app, type in PTPOG, and it will pull up a purple icon. Click on that purple icon and you can join our ministry program and you will love it. God will bless you. You will be notified every single day when a uh, when we go live every morning at 8.30 for our morning devotion. God be with you. God bless you. I pray the Lord be with you and all that you say and do. May the Lord watch between me and you while we're, des while we're separated, excuse me, one from another. And please always remember, don't ever forget P T P O G. Practice the presence of God in your daily life. I promise you, God promises you, he will lift you up in his due time if you learn to lower yourself before his mighty great hand. God be with you. I love you. Take care, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace.